Despite the flood of supplement options, only a few truly live up to their claims, and I'm here to reveal the five top supplements that actually work, and I think you'll be surprised by what makes the list. Now, a common mistake that people make when choosing supplements is getting caught up in flashy headlines about some new miracle supplement, and they end up spending money on expensive products that don't deliver real benefits. And these headlines often come from studies from single cells or mice, not humans. And the problem is, what works in cells or mice, it often doesn't work in people. So in this video, we'll focus solely on supplements backed by human randomized clinical trials. Plus, I'll also mention reliable brands to consider. Now, the first supplement on this list is omega-3, but there are two controversies we need to go through to make sure that we're using the supplement correctly. Omega-3 supplements come in two forms, EPA and DHA, or EPA only. And the most famous proposed benefit is a reduction in heart disease, which brings us to the first controversy. Excitement for omega-3 came from older studies like this one in 2006, which showed that people who ate fish rich in omega-3 had a 36% lower risk of dying from heart disease. And you can see this on the graph quite clearly, that as omega-3 intake increases, the risk of dying from heart disease decreases. But that's fish intake. What about from omega-3 supplements? And here's where the first controversy begins. In 2007, the JALIS study, which is an open-label study involving over 18,000 people with high cholesterol showed that people who took EPA supplements had a 19% lower risk of heart disease. And while that's a really encouraging finding, ideally what we want is a double-blind study where the people in the study, they don't know if they're taking the placebo or the omega-3, and the controversy is coming. Now, it was the Reducer trial in 2019, which was the study that we were waiting for. It was a double-blind study, and it showed a significant reduction in heart disease for the EPA group compared to the placebo group. Now, that all sounds wonderful, but here is where the controversy begins. In the Reducer trial, the placebo or the dummy pill, it was filled with mineral oil and that's a problem because mineral oil can be toxic. The people who were taking the mineral oil, they had higher levels of cholesterol and inflammation. So it's possible that the EPA or the omega-3 group may not have experienced any actual benefits. It was just that the placebo was toxic and the people in that group were being poisoned and that explains the so-called positive results seen in the EPA group. To add to this confusion is another study called the STRENGTH study, and that study found no benefit for omega-3, and it was stopped early because of disappointing results. So what do we make of this mess? Do omega-3 supplements actually reduce heart disease or not, and have saved the best study for last? This study is called the VITAL trial, and it's the largest of all of the studies that we've gone through. It involved over 25,000 people. That study showed a 28% reduction in the risk of having a heart attack if you take omega-3, compared to the placebo group. Plus, when the Mayo Clinic did what's called a meta-analysis, where they combined all of the different studies together, they concluded that the omega-3 supplements are associated with a reduction in the risk of heart attacks with a high-grade certainty. Now, to round off the benefits of omega-3 supplements, before we have a look at the side effects and the second controversy, omega-3 lowers triglyceride levels, it improves blood pressure and reduces heart rate, it also lowers inflammation levels, and those benefits are taken directly from the clinical guidelines. But here is where we need to talk about the side effects, which brings us onto the second of two controversies. High doses of omega-3, they're associated with an increased risk of developing an abnormal heart rhythm called atrial fibrillation. Now, normally, the heart has a nice, steady beat, but with atrial fibrillation, the beat goes completely out of sync. It speeds up and it slows down at random times. This means that the heart can't pump blood as well as it should, and it can lead to a stroke. However, the VITAL trial, which used a lower dose of 840 milligrams, did not see this risk. So personally, I plan to continue taking a combined form of omega-3 in the form of EPA and DHA at a similar dose used in the VITAL trial, so around 1 gram, and that's to maximize the benefits while minimizing any risk of harms. Remember, mega-dosing anything can lead to significant side effects. Regarding which brands to consider, we need to make sure that any product that we use is third-party tested for purity and heavy metal content. So labdoor.com is a great resource, and so is consumerlab.com. Currently, the brand that I'm using is Uno Cardio. The second supplement also improves heart health, but it's severely underrated, and it's a supplement that I think most people should probably take. It helps to lower heart disease, lower blood cholesterol, 
cholesterol levels, improved blood sugar control and can be used to help treat irritable bowel syndrome. And I think the reason that a lot of people don't even consider it on their radar is that it's not a particularly exciting supplement. It's not one that's going to generate headlines and it's certainly not patentable. So pharma companies, they can't really make money from it. I am, of course, talking about psyllium husk, but there are three safety concerns with psyllium husk that I go through at the end of this section. Psyllium husk is a high fiber powder, primarily soluble fiber, and it helps in digestion and is beneficial for irritable bowel syndrome. A 2019 review in the Lancet Journal showed that as fiber intake increases, the risk of heart disease and death decreases. So psyllium husk can be added to a healthy diet to further increase fiber intake and its benefits. But just know that no supplement will ever replace a healthy diet. We need to supplement an existing healthy diet. Now, when having a look at the research on psyllium husk specifically, a 2023 study showed that psyllium husk reduces insulin resistance, blood pressure, and total cholesterol. But like I mentioned earlier, there are three critical points to make sure that you're taking psyllium husk correctly. First is that we need to select a great brand. Lead is a known contaminant in psyllium husk, and ConsumerLab.com picked Organic India psyllium whole husk fiber as their top brand because of a very, very low lead content. The second point is that when starting with psyllium husk, make sure to start at a very low dose and slowly build up the dose. So I've slowly built up to 5 grams a day. That's the dose that works best for me. And make sure to take psyllium with lots of water. The final important point about psyllium husk is that it can slow down the absorption of micronutrients, but not total absorption of micronutrients. So while psyllium husk, it's not a headline grabbing supplement, it's got a large evidence base behind it. The third supplement has some new research that was powerful enough to convince even my grandma to start taking it. The supplement is creatine, but the new research is not about muscle performance as you may have expected. I'll then address creatine safety because there are two important concerns, and then I'll explain whether you should consider taking it too. So what is the new research that was powerful enough to convince my grandma to start taking creatine? Well, like I mentioned, most people focus solely on creatine's muscle performance effects, but there's more to the story. While 95% of the body's creatine is stored in muscles, the remaining 5% is found in the brain, kidneys, and liver, and it's the creatine in the brain that was particularly intriguing for my grandma. There's good evidence showing that certain challenges, such as a lack of sleep or even aging, can decrease the brain creatine levels. So to figure out if creatine supplements do improve cognitive performance and memory, scientists conducted a large review of all of the studies called a meta-analysis. They included 10 studies, and the main analysis showed that creatine supplementation improved memory performance compared to a placebo, and it was particularly strong for older adults. Now, when I told my grandma about the study, she was very intrigued and she wanted to start taking creatine. But we need to address safety, and the two famous safety concerns are kidney damage and hair loss, but both of those have been disproven, and I go through the research on those concerns in this video here. The only consistent side effect is weight gain due to increased lean muscle mass. But what dose and form of creatine is best, and should you consider taking creatine? Well, the most studied form of creatine is creatine monohydrate. It's cheap, it's well absorbed, and that's the form that I recommend to my grandma. We both take 5 grams a day, and the brand we use is Optimum Nutrition. Moving to the fourth supplement on the list, this one also has great evidence for improved cognitive performance. A massive study called the Cosmos Study was done, and as part of that, three ancillary studies were done that looked at many measures of cognitive performance. They were the Cosmos Mind, Cosmos Web, and Cosmos Clinic studies, and the data from all three of those studies were then combined into a meta-analysis, including over 5,000 people, and we can see robust improvements in cognition and memory. But how big is the effect, and what I mean is how much benefit will the supplement provide to our brain performance? Well, the difference between the group who took the placebo and the group who took the supplement was about two years less cognitive aging, and given that the studies only ran for two to three years. That's pretty significant. But here's where the first of two controversies begins. The supplement I'm referring to here in this video is a multivitamin and mineral supplement. And before these three Cosmos studies were done, another long-term study also looked at cognition and whether a multivitamin could improve brain performance. That study was called the Physician Study 2. It was also a randomized, double-blind placebo-controlled trial, and it involved just under 6,000 male physicians. But in contrast to the Cosmos studies, the Physician's trial found 
found no difference in cognitive performance over the study period. So what's going on? Why does the physician study show no benefit, but the Cosmos studies do? And there are three possible explanations. The first is that the Cosmos studies included both older males and females, whereas the physician study only included males. The second possible reason is that the physician study, they only started cognitive testing after about two and a half years of the study starting. As a result, the cognitive benefits associated with the multivitamin and mineral supplements that were observed in the Cosmos studies may have been missed in the physician study. And the third difference, which is possibly the most important one, is that there were differences in the supplements used. So in the Cosmos study, the supplement included lutein and lycopene. And remember lutein and lycopene because that's important for later in the video when I discuss how to select a multivitamin and mineral supplement. The second controversy brings me onto a recent study that's gone viral. Now, we've had study after study showing that multivitamin supplements do not reduce the risk of cancer, cardiovascular disease, or death rates. And this new study involved over 390,000 participants. That study, you guessed it, also shows no benefits for cardiovascular disease, cancer, or death rates. So the new study reinforces what was already strongly suspected. Instead, I personally take a multivitamin and mineral supplement because of the Cosmos results on brain performance. But that leads us onto the next question. How do we select a multivitamin and mineral supplement? So first, a warning about megadosing, which many of you who are subscribed to this channel will be familiar with. Supplements should complement an already healthy diet and help us reach our recommended daily intakes of micronutrients. But unfortunately, many of the multivitamins that are on the market today, they contain doses that are orders of magnitude higher than the recommended daily intakes, and higher is not always better. Luckily for us, the multivitamin that was used in the Cosmos study, it is appropriately dosed, and it's called Centrum Silver. Now, I considered taking the supplement, but for me, there was a problem. As a 2022 analysis by the US Preventative Services Task Force concluded, with moderate certainty that there are harms from supplementing with beta-carotene, and those harms outweigh the benefits. Beta-carotene is converted by the body into vitamin A. They also recommend against using vitamin E supplements due to evidence that both beta-carotene and vitamin E, as well as high doses of vitamin A, may increase mortality. Now, it's easy to get vitamin A and E from a healthy diet, so I didn't want a supplement that included those vitamins. I also wanted a supplement with vitamin K2, magnesium taurate, trimethylglycine for its cognitive and exercise benefits, as well as hyaluronic acid for skin health, which is why I designed microvitamin. But please, just because I take a supplement does not in any way mean that you should as well. And we're already on microvitamin formula version 5, and based on the Cosmos studies, I'm going to add in lutein and lycopene to formula version 6. As for why I wanted to include magnesium in the form of magnesium taurate, make sure to check out this video here, where I go into detail about magnesium supplementation. The fifth supplement on this list helps with sleep. Now, a staggering 58% of adults struggle with sleep, and many have turned to melatonin supplements. Especially now, because of reports of melatonin's powerful antioxidant and anti-inflammatory effects, as well as support for brain and nerve health. Now, the research on melatonin is vast, but before we have a look at the potential benefits, such as anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effects, let's first explore sleep. Melatonin is made naturally in the body by the pineal gland in the brain, and for some people who struggle to fall asleep, their melatonin levels, they don't start to rise at the correct time. In a meta-analysis of 14 studies, melatonin was shown to reduce the time it took to fall asleep, and there was a separate review showing improved sleep quality. But there are two important points to consider when supplementing with melatonin. The first is that there doesn't appear to be any additional benefits from taking higher doses compared to lower doses. And the second is that melatonin should be taken in the early evening, at least one and a half hours before you're trying to fall asleep. And this is because melatonin works as a chronobiotic agent, meaning that it helps to synchronize the body's sleep-wake cycle. So what is the ideal dose? And then we'll cover a link between melatonin and aging. Now, unfortunately, many melatonin supplements are anything but low dose. You can buy even up to 10 milligram doses over the counter. And we have no idea the long-term consequences of taking such high doses of melatonin. All of the studies that we have at the moment, they're short-term. Plus, it's highly unlikely that there are any additional benefits from taking an increased dose. 
These high doses can also make people feel groggy in the morning, cause dizziness, dry mouth, affect menstrual cycles, and cause overproduction of a hormone called prolactin. So there are certainly potential risks of high dose melatonin. Now the body produces between 10 to 80 micrograms of melatonin per hour at night. So up to 640 micrograms for an eight hour sleep. So personally, I supplement with 300 micrograms and I take it one to two hours before I want to fall asleep. As for other potential benefits of melatonin, there's an emerging hypothesis that the decline in melatonin levels as we age may contribute to increased inflammation and damage. However, more studies are needed before any specific claims can be made. In this video, I didn't mention two supplements that have got great evidence for improved skin health and reduced wrinkles, so make sure to check out this next video here that explains an evidence-based protocol to reverse the signs of skin aging, and a massive thank you to all of the patrons supporting the channel.